behalf on behalf of the hosts uh, and on behalf of our partners for this event, um, the main host being the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies and the co-hosts being ASAF, SAS, and the Institute of Natural Resources. It is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to chair the first session. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers and we will set the scene uh, or context for the series of talks, which by the way, stretch over one month. Uh, the number of speakers that we have will give you an indication of the interest that people have in this area of scientific dialogue. And we assure you a variety of talks from a wide range of disciplines. With that said, I would now like to hand you over to the director of the Scientific Advisory Group on, on Emergencies, Prof. Jerome Singh, uh, to pass a few opening remarks. And then we will slip straight into the talks for today. Prof. Singh. Thank you very much, Session. So good morning, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, also known as SAGE, to the first webinar series, or the first webinar in a series that's focused on the theme of why environmental management must become the new normal. Now, I just thought, because it's the first seminar, I just need to say something, because SAGE hasn't officially been launched yet, but the launch will be quite imminent, but it hasn't stopped us from doing lots of work in the meantime. But SAGE, or the Scientific Advisory Group on Emergencies, is an initiative funded under the auspices of the Science, Grant, uh, Science Granting Council's initiative in Sub-Saharan Africa, also known as the SGCI, the National Research Foundation of South Africa, and is funded by a range of different funders, including the Canadian International Development Research Center, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, also known as CEDA, the United Kingdom Department for International Development, also known as DFID, and the UK Innovation uh, Research and Innovation, also known as UKRI, and that's done through the Newton Fund. And lastly, it's also funded and co-funded by the Government of Quebec and the Department of Science and Innovation of South Africa. So SAGE is housed within the Academy of Science of South Africa, and it's steered by members of the Academy of Science of South Africa and the Young Academy of Science of South Africa. And I just wanted to point out that this webinar is an event organized by the steering committee of SAGE, the Academy of Sciences of South Africa, the South African Young Academy of Sciences, and of course, the Institute for Natural Resources. And in the context of SAGE activities, we focus mainly on emergencies and also potential emergencies. And so we also take, aside from issuing rapid advisories to the government and to other relevant stakeholders, we also aim to undertake engagement with stakeholders on awareness raising and facilitating resilience when it comes to emergencies, potential emergencies. And it was in the context of this specific issue of engagement and awareness raising that we are hosting the series. So on that note, I want to especially thank the conceptualizers and also the coordinators of the series, both of whom serve on the steering and coordinating committee of SAGE, and that's Professor Elisa LaRue and Dr. Sir Shinaidu. And on that note, I'll just stop there and say thank you again for joining us on this first series. We're quite excited to launch this. And I will hand you over now to Dr. Sir Shinaidu for the rest of the program. But thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jerome. Colleagues, we thought it best that we set the scene uh, for you uh, who will be with us hopefully for the next four weeks and series of talks of which there are 10 in total. And we wanted to give you an idea of, of why this particular theme or topic is so important to us. Why environmental management must become the new normal. Uh, and I want to begin with the motivation behind the series. And if those uh, in the audience can give me an indication of whether you can see the screen changing, I'd appreciate that.
So the motivation behind the series begins with pandemic and disaster resilience. The ability to deal with the shocks of a pandemic or disaster and recover from them. Now, this sort of pandemic or disaster resilience requires approaches and tools that permit society to control threats to human life while preserving essential public institutions and of particular interest to us, ecosystem services, while still mobilizing the economy to provide surge capacity to prevent loss of life and keeping the rest of the economy maximally open. Many economies are heavily reliant on, on, on natural resource bases and the ecosystem services provided by ecological infrastructure. And this was particularly concerning to us as a group. This reliance on the natural resource base, but yet this low level of interest in its preservation. Now, pandemic and disaster resilience require approaches that prevent the following. One, resource depletion, where consumption of natural resources is faster than it can be replenished. And two, environmental degradation and loss of ecosystem services. So this was the motivation behind our conceptualization of this series of talks. The fact that pandemic and disaster resilience need to be at the forefront of our planning around resilience, but ecosystem services need to feature very highly in terms of our preparation around pandemics and disaster management. So looking at the situational assessment and our appreciation of what has happened over the last couple of months, there's been widespread underpreparedness of countries in managing pandemics, emergencies, and there's evidence of very, very fragile economies. These shocks that have been experienced throughout the world, most recently in the context of COVID-19, have exposed a very heavy reliance on a linear as opposed to a circular economy. Environmental positives, however, were also seen, brought about mainly by the lockdown, but these have been very, very quickly eclipsed. Increased waste generation, increased demand for raw materials for manufacturing, the shutdown of the recycling sector, increased production of single-use plastic products, and widespread non-sustainable natural resource use mainly in the context of water. So, when we got together as a group to conceptualize this series of talks, what emerged is that emergency and disaster preparedness requires more proactive than reactive environmental management. And this management needs to stretch across all spheres of environmental management, from global migration all the way through to air quality. And we believe as a group that perhaps the dialogue needs to move towards an environmental vaccine, a vaccine that embodies environmental management and its needs to be embedded in disaster management plans. Now, there are issues around the, the use of the term disaster as well. And many, many amongst us may argue that the pandemic management seated within a disaster management plan was not an ideal approach, particularly in the South African context. But what is clear is that the use of integrated environmental management tools can build pandemic and emergency or disaster resilience. 
Integrated environmental management is an approach to management of the environment that takes into account the complex, multifaceted, and interconnected nature of the environment. IEM is a framework that promotes a holistic and interconnected approach to managing environmental systems through a goal oriented and strategic process. IEM as a framework is both theoretical and practical in terms of finding the right balance between development and environment in a sustainable manner. Now, IEM is, is not a new concept. It's not a new approach, but its application in actually enhancing disaster and emergency preparedness is something that still deserves more theoretical thought. It's a holistic approach to management to address a complex land and water management problems. The purpose of IEM is to integrate management activities through stakeholder committees composed of government and non-government representatives. Through IEM, we believe that we can stretch out our policies to manage and plan for limited available natural resources to be utilized in a very sustainable way during an emergency and subsequently rebuild our economy on the backbone of our natural resource base and ecological infrastructure. With that context and with our thinking around how our natural resource base can actually empower us during periods of disasters and emergencies and be used as a springboard for surge capacity during these times. I want to now bring on board our first speaker for today. And our first speaker is all the way from Morocco, Professor Larson El Yusfi. And his talk today focuses on integrated water resources management and ethics. And given the raging arguments around the sharing of resources and the socio-spatial conflict that has arisen as a consequence of the, the uh, construction of dams uh, across Africa and other parts of the developing world, I think it is a very, very, poignant time to actually address this area of water resources and ethics. Professor Larsen El Yusfi is an associate professor at the Department of Environmental Engineering at Kenifra Higher School of Technology in Morocco. And he is the coordinating uh, uh, and the training head of the agricultural and rural development sector. He specialized in agro environment and focuses his research in studying developing sustainable solutions for crop production management and water resources management. He is the president of the science and development NGO in Morocco. And it is my pleasure to welcome him today as our first speaker in this series. Professor Larsen El Yusfi, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sershin. Uh, I thank you for the great invitation and happy, uh, do you hear me very well? Yes, we can hear you and you can now share your screen. Yes, I will do in a moment.
it's visible yes you are visible okay perfect thank you again for the invitation um i will i will be a portion uh, the thematic of of environmental management um as a an urgent issue uh especially with the, the new uh, raising emergencies and challenges that we are facing uh, uh, in africa and in the world uh, i will be focus focusing on water management and um, the integrated water resource management approach and trying to, to make it also to integrate some aspects related to ethics, some initiatives to integrate ethics in the management. So uh, in my presentation, I, I hope I will, I will not be uh, very long. I will uh, start giving examples from uh, Morocco and uh, also giving some challenges in Africa regarding water resource management and also go to the, to, to, to the ethics aspects and how can we deal with the, this integrated water resource management for a better sustainability. So uh, first of all, I want to mention that uh, I am affiliate of the African Academy of Science uh, and we, are, we have a group there of young scientists uh, as affiliates uh, that works on agriculture, food security and nutrition science. And uh, also I am part of the executive committee of GYA. Just I want to share the information for the, the presence if they are interested to, to know about this organization or to join. Thank you. So I will uh, start from uh, Morocco, uh, my country. So uh, here in Morocco uh, is, is a, a semi-desertic uh, country. Uh, we have more or less uh, 34 uh, million people and more of the 50% of the, the country is desertic. And uh, we have a big potential of water uh, that comes from surface water and groundwater from, the, from uh, important resources. But we have a very, very big uh, variation in, the, in water uh, resources, especially uh, surface water with the variation from a year to a year or from month to month. So we have big variability. And also uh, we have an over exploitation of groundwater uh, because for many uh, activities and especially for agriculture that consumes 80% of uh, water resources. And we have uh, an important depletion and reduction of the level of groundwater across the country. Uh, we have also problems related to disparation and uh, degradation of many lakes uh, because of the, the, the consumption of groundwater around the lakes. And also we have problems uh, related to uh, water pollution uh for uh, related to many activities and i'm giving this example from morocco and it can be valid for many countries and we can be variable from one country to another pollution of water related to uh, domestic use agriculture industry etc so we have also uh, other constraints related to of course to the management of water the policy uh, etc and also, we, we, we should highlight when, when we talk about water resource, we should highlight the impact of climate change. And I can give you example here of Morocco. So according to the, to the, the future uh, provision, we will have uh, an, an average of uh, rising temperature of two to five degrees by the end of century. And this uh, will reduce in the future by 10 to 30. So we have this risk. And we can see uh, this variation from one year to, uh, to another uh, in real management of water resources. And uh, climate change also uh, can be uh, can give also the, can be accompanied with other risks related to flooding. Uh, so we can see here in Morocco or in Africa many events of flooding uh, that comes with climate change and the var climate variation we can see. So uh, with this situation, 
because the consumption of water is very high, uh, many a lot of pressure on water resources are for surface and uh, groundwater. So in Morocco, for example, we, we are going from a situation of uh, water stress to a situation of scarcity of, of water. So it's an urgent situation and we need to take it uh, urgently into consideration. I think it's the case of many uh, similar countries, climate, climate here in, in Africa. So um, I give this example of Morocco and now I give you the overview in, uh, of the situation in Africa, the main challenges and threats that uh, impact the environmental stability in Africa related to water resources. So we have, uh, when we have a problem uh, with uh, management of water, especially because we need to uh, store more water from from uh, surface water, we have to build more dams. For example, in Morocco, now we have more or less 17 dams are under construction. And with the construction of these dams, we have a lot of loss of uh, unique habitats and biodiversity. And also these dams, uh, despite the negative uh, impact on biodiversity, they help in reducing the flood, flooding uh, risk, uh, also, uh, we have in, in Africa the challenges of pollution and, as I mentioned, the change in microclimate and climate. Uh, we have also a challenge, big challenge of groundwater le level that is declining uh, in all parts of Africa because of the large scale irrigation schemes uh, that cause also salinization of soil and many other problems. So uh, we have a low capacity in water management or let's say a weak capacity in uh, water management in, uh, from institutional point of view. So this is the, this are the, the main challenges. In, ad in addition to that, we have uh, a problem of inequality or uh, a bad distribution of water. So we have inadequate access we have problems of erosion, as I mentioned, the uh, flooding, drought, and creating certification. So uh, there is also a big competition for water use from different sectors, from agriculture, from industry, from mining activities. And also we have a lack in the low of capacity in investment, and also uh, the degradation of water, water sheds, and the, including the degradation of quality, uh, of water and the pollution of water with the, the, the use in different activities. And also we have the problem of lack of the data and the poor data that we have available. And also the, la the lack or the, the lack of cooperation between uh, institutions in, inside the country and regionally, etc. So one of the best solutions to address those challenges is to adopt the integrated water resource management principles, so we can uh, minimize these problems. Integrated water resource management uh, means we we should include all the aspects and all the sectors and all the solutions. Uh, and to take them into consideration in one throat so we can uh, minimize the risks. So in order to, to explain this uh, uh, integrated water resource management, I will go quickly uh, on a case in, in Morocco, uh, which is a region, uh, Sousmessa region in, uh, in the so southwest of Morocco. It's one of the big regions that uh, exports a lot of fruits and veget vegetables to Europe and other countries. And in this region is very important because it has the suitable environment for a good production and good quality. Um, in this region, we can see that there is a big demand for, the, for agriculture. Uh, more than 70% uh, is uh, used for uh, irrigation. And you can see the state of uh, water resources. So we have uh, the resources available is around, for example, nine, 900 uh, million cubic meters and the, the demand is higher. So in this region, uh, we are producing a lot of agricultural fruits and vegetables and the agricultural 
irrigation is demanding too much, and we have a big deficit uh, of uh, annual deficit of uh, water in this region. So there is the demand for irrigation of uh, green spaces for drinking water and industry extra, but the main activity is agriculture. So there is uh, a need to mobilize. Uh, other resources that can be uh, available to replace this deficit. So one of them is to mobilize more surface water. So building more dams also to reuse treated waste water. So in for different and also for uh, to 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 use the desalination of sea water. Uh, and also uh, rainwater collection and also to convert. Uh, many uh, areas of irrigated agriculture from technologies that are consuming more to new technologies that consume and uh, have an economy of water. These are the main sources uh, that we can adopt so we can integrate to have an integrated uh, water resource management. So in this region, we have a big potential of waste water production and we can uh, have a big level of treatment of this water so uh, we can uh, use them for irrigation especially for golf in this region also we have touristic activities that consume too much water for in uh, in services but also in golf for sport activities so the uh, uh, treated water can be uh, used in this in this sense so um, this, uh, this, this demand uh, is big, so we need to develop all these kind of solutions. So I will do it quickly. So in this region, there is a, a need to convert more uh, cultivated area from the traditional uh, irrigation systems that are that consume the, too much and that have uh, more or less efficiency in irrigation to more uh, economic uh, technologies like drip irrigation. So there is an effort to convert many areas so we can have an economy of more or less 20% of, uh, of water and to save it for the future and for other use, users. So in this region also, we adopted the, the use of technology by adopting a big network of climate data uh, networks to collect more data and to bring this data to growers because they consume too much water. So they, they, they will save messages in their uh, phones. So they reduce the amount of use of water in their fields. In this way also we can help in reducing uh, the, the consumption. Also at the level of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the fields of, of growers, so we can reduce also the, we can control the amount of water that's, uh, that is given to the plants and, and we can reduce so much uh, the consumption of water. So despite this, uh, the efforts and uh, the, the, in this case of this region in Morocco, there, is, there are a lot of efforts to, to integrate more solutions. There is uh, at the moment a big station of desalinization of water so to, to reduce this deficit in irrigation. But this desalinization station and dams has a big impact on environment. And uh, we can see that are, there are many other activities and many, many other ecosystems that, that are uh, really um, affected negatively by this uh, project. So for the same region, we can, uh, as I said, it's one of the important region in export and production of uh, citrus and tomato. And here I want to highlight uh, the water print concept that is, that is uh, a way to measure uh, the, the sustainability of production of agriculture and also uh, how we use this water. And a good example here from this region that exports citrus and tomato. And they will ask, we are, ask question about this. So for example, in this, uh, for Emir Morocco, the production uh, of citrus can consume more or less, we have production 1.3 1, 1. million of tons and we export more or less 40% of this production. And, um, and we can ask how, how much water we consume to produce this, uh, this uh, citrus. So we have more or less 0.5 cubic meters per kilogram. 
and when we export water, we, con we consume water for production. And also, we uh, the fruit contains water and uh, consumes too much. So we are exporting and uh, producing and losing more or less 265 billion cubic meter, which which is the equivalent of uh, uh, dam of uh, example of this dam here in the same region. For tomato, it's the same case. So we have exportation of tomato uh, and 24 production percent of production. So the, I give you this example of water prints to ask a question if the system of production and exportation is sustainable or not, should we change immediately the strategies and to adopt uh, more strategies that can, con can have a more economy of water and if exportation and uh, is a solution or to reduce the, the exportation of the fruits because we have an emergency to, to for example, in the same region here, there is a problem of, uh, of at, at the moment in these days, they have a lack of uh, drinking water, but they continue exporting fruits and uh, vegetables from the region. And the project of desalinization, yes, it's a solution, but the, the, the sustainability of the system there is uh, under question because we, we need to have urgent solutions now and also long-term uh, solutions. So for, for example, this region, it's uh, from a social point of view, it's difficult to stop the production activities because many growers working there, a lot of labor created thousands and thousands of industry uh, related to agri agriculture activities. And it's really difficult to stop the exportation and stop the exploitation of water. So there is a need to think about new uh, solutions and new intelligent solutions that, that are sustainable. So um, in order, I give you this example to show uh, the sustainability aspect and the urgent aspect uh, related to water use and, and the, the eco economic aspects and social aspects in this, this region, Susmasa region. So in general, uh, the regional recommendation for a sustainable water resource management demands, there, there, there is a need to have more coordina coordination and more decentralized management structures. Uh, at, the, at the regional level, for example, for this region and also for a, for a national level. So we need also to involve all stakeholders, not only water man uh, managers, but economists and also social scientists that should be involved uh, in all aspects to, this, to take, to make a decision about the future of a region, uh, related in, especially for water uh, management. Also, there needs an, uh, to, a need to develop more uh, frameworks uh, and also to develop synergies and to learn from experience from other countries and other regions. And also, they, uh, it's urgent also not only to work on water uh, as a part, but also to work on food and energy and to include us in the nexus to, in order to make decision because energy also is important. And I know, uh, for example, in South Africa in those days, there was some problems of electricity and we, sh we should, uh, we should uh, include energy and water and food in all, especially when we have these this cases of energies so we can take decisions and we have scenarios for the future. So, uh, as integrated solutions, so we have we, we should think about the equality and distribution of the resources for water, for example. There, uh, for example, if the growers and uh, the irrigators and uh, are are using uh, uh, a lot of water that uh, that is wasted, and uh, we have a rural population that don't have access to water, so we need to change the situation. So we need more education, use of technology, collaboration, and involving of youth, but also science. So uh, regarding ethics, 
So we had a, a project uh, with collaborators and colleagues in, uh, in, in South Africa and Europe, and also uh, other countries in Africa. So uh, in this approach we adopted, we tried, for example, in this case study in Morocco and other case studies, we tried to apply this approach of systemic uh, relation, uh, relational uh, perspective that includes all the aspects because uh, humans, uh, as users or as a part of the ecosystem are, uh, we should respect these humans and equalities and to, to take, to, to consider them as integral and inherent part of the, the ecosystem. Also, there is uh, a need to consider the, 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 the ecological and the social comp component of the, of, the, of the ecosystem as dynamic complex and very interactive. The ecosystem, the humans uh, are interactive and we should in all our strategies, all our projects, our uh, decisions take into consideration very deeply this relationship because uh, decision makers, they focus on the resources uh, exploitation of the resource, for example, for economic activities. But humans, they are not taken into consideration as they could be uh, in order to, re to respect their, uh, their well-being in the ecosystem, the satisfaction, satisfaction in, in a good and equal way of their needs, uh, and also to respect the the ecosystem and to protect it as much as possible. This is the group of uh, our working group and we still continue on uh, case studies. And also I want to, to highlight here that in addition to the human aspects and uh, social aspects, so we should focus really on integrating climate, water, food, energy and nexus uh, in all our decision making in uh, at the country level, regional level and also at the continent in Africa. So we work together, we and the, and the colleague and other colleagues to compare the state of the the, the case and we published this paper about uh, water, food and energy nexus in Morocco and Africa to compare cases of water uh, management and also energy and the competition between sectors and also to say if there are policies and regulations that take into consideration all these aspects uh, including the climate, uh, water, food and energy and uh, you can uh, have a look on the, on the outputs of the the, uh, of the, this, this paper in which we urge that there is a, a need and that there is a lack of regulation that take into consideration all this nexus uh, because all the policies are produced separately for water, for food, for energy, for environment. So we need an integrative solutions and policies that take into consideration all those aspects. And with this, I thank you for your attention and uh, sorry if I was uh, very long. Thank you. Merci, uh, Monsieur, and thank you so much for bringing in the integrated approach to water resource management into your talk. I think it fits in perfectly for our argument that integrated uh, environmental management uh, uh, presents a potential solution to building resilience around emergencies and disasters. Um, I'm going to open into the floor now for questions. And colleagues, please feel free. The reason why we have scheduled this to, to run over one and a half hours is that we wanted to give people the chance to really engage around these issues. Uh, very often webinars are so rushed and so crammed that it doesn't allow the space for scientific dialogue. So I'm going to open up uh, very shortly four questions from the floor. But Larson, if I could pose the first question. Uh, the concept of water resilience uh, has, has become very, very important for governments around the world and building water resilience amongst their people, their citizens, their communities. But there is an argument that is raging amongst the social scientists and uh, you know, the environmental scientists around self-supply. 
uh, and what I mean by self-supply is whether government should be making rural communities in particular more capacitated to supply themselves with water or more capacitated in the context of receiving water from government service providers. And, and, and there is an argument, particularly in very high altitude areas where communities are reliant on springs, uh, on, on whether government should be piping the water to those communities and making them reliant on the government supply or capacitating themselves to become more resilient in terms of self-supply. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, yes, it, it's an interesting uh, question. Um, so uh, we talk about, for example, water resilience, especially uh, in, in the moment of crisis. So, uh, and when we become, the, where we have, for example, some rural areas, they don't, they don't have uh, zero cubic meter of water, they don't have access to, uh, to sanitation and also to drinking water. And, and this uh, should be avoided because we need to have these integrated solutions. It's really very difficult for rural areas to have this self-service uh, water. Uh, they already have in some parts when they have, for example, uh, groundwater, uh, available, they can have their proper uh, wells and they use it. But uh, when there is, when they relate to surface water, so uh, I think uh, is the rule of uh, the government and also uh, the companies and also the organism institutions that are managing water, they have to take this responsibility and to uh, invest more in uh, making available uh, water resources and distributed in an equal way. Uh, even uh, that's the, the, the challenge in some parts of the, of the country may be a uh, cost, uh, cost effective uh, distribution of water. For example, we have sometimes, for example, in some cases here in Morocco and other parts, we have a big water resource uh, in one region that is collected in a dam. And the, 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 the dilemma here, for example, you can find that uh, the rural areas around the dam, they don't have the access to water. There is a problem of equality uh, here. And there, there is a need to, uh, to, to resolve this problem because even it costs too much to uh, make the network available, a network of water available for these rural areas, uh, but it should be uh, done. The investment should be forced because uh, they have the right to have to access to water because they have the resources in their region that, and they are used for other activities like agriculture and mining activities. And we can see this, uh, this uh, scenario uh, in many parts of Africa. So there is a need to uh, have also NGOs and the involvement of uh, social, um, let's say, uh, associations and NGOs that should also uh, be partner in finding solution for these rural areas so they can uh, also help them. There is a risk also of the quality of water if rural areas, they have self-service of water. There is a risk of quality. So there is a need to invest more and to collaborate more for more intelligent solutions in rural areas. Thank you so much, Larson. I'm now going to open it up to the floor. Uh, if there are any questions uh, on this particular aspect, but if we, we have covered most of the important areas of discussion, we will move on to the next speaker. Uh, are there any burning questions? Please feel free to raise your hands. You are unmuted, so you can simply pose the question. Hi, Lassen. This is Aliza. I, I raised my hand. I don't know if it was visible, but hi, it's good to see you. Um, I, I guess I'll go first. Uh, I have heard now so many times in so many places where people say uh, water or yeah, so access to water is a matter of good governance and that we coordinate 
uh, better between stakeholders, right? This is something you said, I've seen it multiple times, and it's true. So it's, it's the management of access to water. Who is responsible for managing this? Who do you think? I mean, does this have to come from government? Is this something that we have, that, that each country just has to wait for somebody at grassroots level to have the, the guts to speak up and start coordinating things? Where do you think is the best place for this sort of coordinating um, responsibility to lie? Thanks. Thank you, Alisa, and happy to see you. Uh, so the question, I think it's the responsibility of uh, policies. And uh, when we talk about policies, so it's the responsibility of the government that should uh, uh, prepare policies based on the experiences and also uh, the dialogues with other uh, stakeholders, because every uh, part of these stakeholders has an experience during the years about the challenges, about the solutions, about the attitudes, about the, the, the social aspects, the economic aspects. So there is an, uh, a need to reshape the policies so that can bring solutions and also that can bring, bring all the stakeholders together so they can uh, have frameworks in, in which we have equality of access of water. So I, I talk about the equality because sometimes when the cost is very higher, the investment is very higher, there is, need, there is a need to have a solidarity between, for example, regions and also the involvement of many stakeholders, not only that can be a concern for with water, but other companies also that can also help in having uh, implementing these projects and frameworks so uh, the water can be available and also in the good quality for all population, uh, despite they are in rural areas or uh, urban areas. So also there is a need, need to involve scientists in order to predict in the future any risks that can uh, that can be uh, in this region or uh, at the level of the country or the region. So there is uh, to have fr fr frameworks and also to have strategies that are uh, based on dialogues with uh, stakeholders. Thanks, thanks, um, Lars. And I also think yeah, if we ignore the government, if it doesn't start there, then it will be very difficult to develop anything that can be implemented, you know, that can, um, yeah, have consequences. Yes I, yes, I agree with you that the reason is to, to have a movement from many stakeholders, so to, to have this dialogue and to push the, the governments to have a uh, better strategies and to bring more solutions uh, for a sustainable use of, uh, of water resources with, uh, with equality with different, uh, different uh, users, because there is a lot of pressure from users, uh, especially for agriculture and mining activities. And also we need to have a voice for other users uh, the normal citizens that are uh, that needs the basic uh, water right of uh, drinking water and sanitation. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Larson. Uh, just to uh, touch on, on on that discussion, uh, the the concept of polycentric governance. Uh, around water management uh, still remains a theoretical uh, argument. Uh, and, and whilst there have been very strong arguments for polycentric governance around water management, uh, I think the, uh, the, the, the concept has not been explored uh, in terms of practice in many parts of the world. Uh, and there are real problems uh, with its implementation. And perhaps that's where the dialogue moves, needs to move to. Uh, is, is polycentric governance pie in the sky? Uh, or is it actually achievable and adaptable in contexts such as South Africa? So thank you, Larson. Um, and thank you, uh, speakers, uh, uh, colleagues. We're now moving on to a talk that I am particularly excited about. Uh, given that it has particular relevance to the East Coast of South Africa, 
where I belong. Um, and the talk is to be delivered uh, by Dr. Anusha Rajkaran from the University of the Western Cape. So we move from a Moroccan to a South African example now. And the talk is entitled, Managing and Measuring the Health of South African Mangrove Forests in a Changing World. Given that uh, we've spent much of the morning talking about socio-ecological systems, I think this is going to be a particularly interesting talk to many in the house at the moment. And if I can ask Larson to switch off his camera as we switch over now to Dr. Anusha Rajkaran, who is an estuarine ecologist with an interest in submerged and emergent macrophytes such as macro mangrove forests, salt marshes, and seagrass. Having received a PhD in botany in 2011 from Nelson Mandela University, she was then appointed as a lecturer in the Department of Botany at Rhodes University later that year. Anusha joined the D Department of Biodiversity and Conservation Biology at the University of Western Cape as a senior lecturer in 2015, and her current research focuses on health, functioning, and distribution of submerged and emerged uh, macrophytes. Um, it is my pleasure now to hand you over to Dr. Anusha Rajkaran and uh, we, we switch over from looking at things through a broad lens to a slightly narrower one in looking at mangroves. But as I mentioned earlier, the importance lies in our appreciation of socio-ecological systems. And if you had to look at any example of a socio-ecological system that demands management in the context of natural disasters and emergencies, it definitely is mangroves. So Dr. Rajkaran, I the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, everyone. I think it is still morning. Um, I hope that you can hear me clearly and that you can uh, see my presentation. We can. Excellent, thank you. Um, so it's a great pleasure uh, to be here today to deliver this uh, talk. Um, I've been working on mangrove forests uh, since I was a, a wee little postgrad student. Um, and it's a, a great pleasure to always give a talk on the mangrove forests of South Africa. I'm just waiting for my slides to change. There we go. Um, so when we talk about mangroves, we have to start uh, the conversation uh, by looking at estuaries in South Africa. All of our mangrove forests in South Africa um, sit in the estuaries um, along the subtropical and um, part of the warm temperate zone uh, within our country. Um, and that is quite um, different to what you would find in um, north um, of us along the East African coastline, where many mangrove forests are found adjacent, um, directly adjacent uh, to the ocean. So our estuaries uh, provide a safe, uh, slow moving habitat uh, where, where the mangroves can form as well as develop. The diversity of estuaries within the country is quite vast. Um, if we compare the extreme east, uh, which is Cozy Bay, uh, in the, the picture on the right hand side, we see quite a different picture to that from the Orange River mouth, which is on the left hand side. So there's a great diversity that is caused by the hydrological as well as climatic um, conditions that will determine the different types of estuaries that we find in our country. Um, recently, there was a reclassification of the estuaries um, and we have now a, a greater range of estuaries within the country and this allows us to manage these estuaries um, much better um, because of the diversity that they represent. So the classification has changed uh, from 1992 um, and this classification is based on estuarine area, the percent time open to the sea, 
Um, an estuary is a body of water that is influenced by the river as well as by the ocean and therefore the time open to the sea um, has great impact on the biota uh, found in the estuary. Um, the types of estuaries are also determined by the tidal range, um, the salinity range, as well as the mixing processes and the sediment. Um, if you look at the table at the top, uh, the red arrows show you where our mangroves um, lie. So the majority of our mangrove populations are in estuaries that have a permanent connection to the sea. And we will see later in the presentation that when this connection is blocked off, there are major ramifications um, for the mangroves and the biota associated with those mangroves. So in our country, we have uh, many emergent and submerged uh, macrophytes. So these are plants that are living within um, our estuary environment. The emergent macrophytes are the salt marsh mangroves, um, as well as reeds and sedges. And the submerged macrophytes are your seagrass beds. In our country, we currently have 1,672 uh, hectares of mangroves. So compared to countries such as Mozambique, Madagascar, um, Kenya and Tanzania, the amount or the area of mangroves is quite restricted in South Africa. And that is because of um, the climatic conditions um, and the water temperature that we find along our uh, coastline. Um, so in the bottom diagram, you would see a uh, what we would call a normal example of the range and distribution of mangroves along an intertidal gradient. And the intertidal area is the area between uh, the low and the high water mark. Um, and we would find Avicinia marina usually sitting on the channel. This is usually called the white mangrove because of the color of the stem. And this is followed by Brugeria and Rhizophora mucronata, which usually sits along the creeks and has these very dramatic prop roots um, that we see. So mangrove um, species in our country is quite restricted in terms of their diversity. Um, Cozy Bay, um, it, which is the border of Mozambique and South Africa, has the greatest number of tree species. Um, and the rest of the country is usually made up of Abyssinia, Brugeria and Rhizophora. This diagram I think is quite important, especially in the context of this uh, seminar series. Um, so we know that the ecological realm is directly linked to the social economic realm. Um, our estuarine habitats are usually called blue habitats and they provide a large number of ecosystem services for which we ben from which we benefit. We also benefit from resource utilization and it takes incredibly healthy systems um, in order to provide the maximum amount of ecosystem services, as well as the um, sustainable uh, uh, delivery of resource, resources from the ecological realm to the social economic realm. And of course, these, um, these systems have to be under some sort of environmental management um, in order for them to maintain that health. So a healthy system provides um, a greater amount of ecosystem services and in an estuary those services are in terms of protection. So we can have bank protection, uh, we can have uh, protection of the uh, landward zones. Um, it also provides refuge and nursery areas and quite topical, it is also a very important um, sink for carbon. So carbon sequestration and carbon storage um, is very important for our blue habitats. On this slide, what I wanted to do was highlight some of the impacts um, that our mangrove forests are experiencing. Um, so if you look at the uh, table on the left-hand side, we have our estuarine names uh, divided into the Eastern Cape as well, and then at the bottom, KwaZulu-Natal. Um, mangrove forests only occur from Cozy Bay down to East London, to the Nahoon Estuary. 
there uh, is one um, estuary further south, which is, which is the Chalumna estuary. Um, and we are finding that these forests further south are becoming more viable uh, with climate change. But our mangrove forests, um, one could say, are, are under um, threat. They are threat threatened by the activities, um, not only within the mangrove forest, but also the activities around the mangrove forest. Um, so if you look on the right hand side, freshwater abstraction. So we've just been talking about how fresh water is used. Um, freshwater abstraction has a huge impact on estuarine functioning, um, heavy metal pollution, uh, as well as oil pollution and coal dust and eutrophication, those are usually happening around the mangrove forest and then um, impact the mangrove forest themselves. Whereas harvesting, livestock browsing and trampling happens within the mangrove forest and that has its own set um, of impacts. In the previous slide, we talked about management. Um, the in levels of environmental management of our KwaZulu-Natal forests are very different to those in the Eastern Cape. Um, a great number of forests in the Eastern Cape have no management authority, and therefore the activities that are happening within them are unmanaged. Um, while KwaZulu-Natal has, um, has more management authority, um, the activities within and around the mangroves are still having a huge impact. So the delivery of that management um, is is vital in order to ensure the mangroves are kept in a healthy condition that is able to provide both the ecosystem services as well as the resources that we rely on. So our research um, and the research has been done across many universities within the country has been driven by anthropogenic activities. So we've wanted to look at how these different activities are affecting the health of the mangrove forests themselves, as well as the biota um, which they support. And these are just some of the different topics that we've looked at within our research um, in terms of agricultural and industrial development, um, hydrological changes that would affect the function and regeneration um, of our um, estuarine habitats, the harvesting for building materials. So this is the direct um, chopping off mangrove wood. Um, and that is for a variety of uh, reasons from um, building houses to cattle kraals to fish traps, which are a unique feature um, found at the Cozy Bay estuary. Um, and um, we find that these impacts are much greater within the Eastern Cape, um, where the rural um, areas within the Eastern Cape have a much greater need and uh, requirement for the natural resources. And then more recently, we've been looking at the movement of man-made particles into estuaries. Um, and we've just um, published a few papers on that. So I will be taking you through some of that research. So for um, specific examples, I'd like to talk about the hydrological changes um, that are a major driver of um, the function and regeneration potential of mangroves. So we know that river mouth manipulations have influenced um, many mangrove forests in different estuaries. Um, and one can compare it from the estuarine lake, such as St. Lucia to Ngobe Zeleni, which is both in the northern KwaZulu-Natal, as well as further south in the eastern Cape at the Kowenhaba estuary. Um, at this particular estuary, and you'll see the image of the estuary at the bottom of the slide, um, there was long-term closure of the estuarine mouth. So this used to be a estuary that had a permanent connection to the sea. Um, this connection was blocked off by a sand berm. Um, and uh, with that blocking off, the water levels within the mangroves began to increase. Now with mangrove forests, um, they have a number of adaptations to living within estuaries. And one of them is that they have aerial roots. So either the prop roots of Rhizophora or the nematophore or pencil roots of Avicennia marina help these 
trees to um, facilitate gas exchange. And when these roots become inundated with water for long periods of time, and here we're talking um, weeks and months, um, these mangroves essentially start to drown. And this is what happened at the Coban Harbor estuary, uh, where we had a long-term mouth closure, an increase in water level, and then a massive die-off um, of the mangrove area. Um, and the very important part about this particular event is that we were able to do long-term monitoring um, of the recovery of the mangrove forest after the mouth had um, opened again and the intertidal area became more tidal. Um, and we were able to pick up a sequence of events um, that would either um, allow the established re-establishment of the mangroves or allow a transition from one particular habitat um, to another. And the initial part was the stabilization of the sediment um, that was key to further colonization of the emergent macrophytes. So in this diagram, we see uh, yellow circles uh, show us um, individual mangrove trees. Either these trees were able to survive the inundation or they were new growth. Um, the yellow arrow shows you the largest area of mangrove forest at this particular estuary. And this was after um, the mouth became open um, and there was normal um, inundation. But you can see that there's very little vegetation um, and that area essentially became a mangrove graveyard, which is what you can see in the diagram at the bottom or the image at the bottom. Um, from that, from the time the mouth was closed, um, the intertidal area was covered with water, there was no visible plant life, and there was a total loss of canopy. Uh, within one to six months of the open mouth condition, you had um, the decomposition of the mangrove trees, sediment stabilization, and signs of what we call the MPBs, which are the microphytobenthos, or the diatoms within the um, sediment. And then we started to see first signs of plant life, which was the salt marsh. Uh, within a year of the mouth opening, the salt marsh cover began to increase and the number of new mangrove individuals also began to increase. Um, and within two years, um, there was a major increase in salt marsh. There was arrival of propagules from other forests and this was facilitated by the open mouth status. And there was the first signs of reproductive activity. So these, you know, if you can look at this as a disaster that took place within the estuary. Um, and once the um, conditions changed within that estuary, um, there was what we call ecological resilience, and therefore there is a progression um, of changes from what was under the disaster conditions to what is now in a state of recovery. When we looked at the impact of resource utilization, uh, which of course reduces the natural base um, of resources by um, essentially cutting down trees, um, we found that um, as in any situation where um, people are looking for particular resources, that the resource they're looking for is what we are not going to find within our um, forest structure. So we can look at um, our research by, or we can use our research to identify exactly how harvesters are behaving within the mangrove forest. So what size of tree are they um, targeting and what is the ecological role of that size class within that particular forest? And of course, there we want to think of it um, in terms of reproductive activity. So are the harvesters targeting a size class that actually produces um, the next generation of tree and how does that affect the um, sustainability of that particular forest. So on the right hand side we see our population structure graphs. Um, at the top we have a diameter which is a diameter at breast height and at the bottom we have um, height of the trees and we can see that in our uh, dark gray bars are the um, harvested areas and in the light gray parts are the non-harvested areas. Um, so we, sorry, the dark 
the dark gray is non-harvested, the light gray is harvested. So in our non-harvested areas, we have greater uh, densities of particular size classes um, compared to our harvested areas. We can also use this kind of research to zone um, zone our different mangrove forests um, and to use that to then identify and prioritize areas that require regrowth and that regrowth can come in terms of replanting uh, or essentially ensuring um, that there are enough seed trees around those areas to ensure natural regeneration. So in this map on the uh, left-hand side is of the Imgazana estuary, which is the third largest estuary in South Africa. And it has the largest, um, sorry, the third largest mangrove forest in South Africa. And it has the largest um, area of Rhizophora mucronata, which is a important tree for um, harvesting for the building of houses and cattle kraals. And we were able to identify areas of where harvesting was of high intensity, medium intensity and low intensity. And of course, man, um, environmental management can then be used to um, uh, manage those parts of the forest in order to increase their health um, and resilience. What we have seen in the Eastern Cape is a move uh, away from harvesting in some estuaries to sand mining. Um, so at Mgazana Estuary, you can often see the scars left behind from sand mining of um, large hills. Um, this is usually unregulated um, and it has a huge impact on the ecological, um, um, ecological uh, circumstances uh, around uh, where the sand mining is taking place. Um, so we have seen changes in how uh, communities use the mangrove forests. Um, I wanted to show you this picture because it shows very clearly another impact that's quite common in the Eastern Cape, which is that of cattle browsing. Um, so there are, as you would know, in the Eastern Cape, large populations of cattle um, that would move from one area to another. Um, and in this particular diagram, all the shorter trees that are um, at the back um, are, are browsed by the um, cattle and therefore they become like mangrove bonsais. And this would affect the way they grow. This would affect the way um, they would sequester carbon and in the way that they would be reproductive um, and to ensure the sustainability of the forest. And you can compare that with the trees that are at the front, which is nearer to the channel, which are very tall trees, um, which are going to be much more healthier and much more productive. Then this is some of the work that we've been doing more recently on the movement of man-made particles into estuaries. Um, and I'm sure everyone on the call has heard about um, and has uh, comprehended the situation of plastics within the environment. Um, we see plastics everywhere. We're also starting to see masks everywhere. Um, and these particles and these objects um, are becoming a major issue within our estuaries. And it brings up a very important question, you know, is it enough to just manage estuaries in isolation? Most of these man-made particles are coming down from the rivers into the estuaries and out to sea. And this is because of catchment to coast connectivity. So our estuaries are sitting uh, in a position where they act as a conduit uh, from the riverine environment to the sea environment. And they are dependent on both the river as well as the sea in order to maintain their productivity and their functioning. Um, so we focused on the mangroves here and with all macrophytes, all plants that are growing in estuaries, they have a, a particular level of trapping ability. And that trapping ability for mangroves is facilitated by their aerial roots, where under natural conditions, they would be trapping sediment and they would be growing um, their own land base essentially. Um, and that trapping ability is now making um, the situation of plastics uh, much more um, pertinent because the mangroves seem to be trapping larger plastics. And once those larger plastics are trapped, 
they begin to break down into what we call microplastics. So if you look at the diagram on the right hand side, um, this is from a master's student, Jolene Govender, uh, from a paper she published recently. These are the kinds of microplastics that we would find within the estuarine channels, um, as well as the estuarine mud. So essentially your macroplastics would be trapped by the aerial roots. And with the um, movement of tidal water, as well as the sun, they would start to break down and they would form um, microplastics. And this is the research that we've been doing in KwaZulu-Natal, as well as the Eastern Cape. And we've been sampling estuaries that have different kinds of developments and threats to them. So if we compare on the left on your screen, St. Lucia at the top, um, to an estuary called Isipingo, which is in the middle of Durban, which is a major city, um, we can see that there's a wide variety of threats that are present within the estuaries, but at different levels. Um, so, for example, um, Isipingo has a higher level of development. There's far more plastic, a lot of effluent coming through the estuary, lots of fishing activity and maritime activities. In comparison to St. Lucia, where you have lower levels of development, uh, lower levels of plastic and, and lower levels um, of animal browsing or footprints, uh, footprints and footpaths within the mangroves. And this has an impact on the amount of microplastics that we find, as well as the types of microplastics that we find. So these graphs on the right hand side show you um, microplastics within the water at the top, as well as the microplastics within the sediment. So within an estuary, there are various components that we need to take into account. And the most important thing here for the water um, diagram is we see a major difference between our wet season and dry season. And I'm sure most of you, if you're from Durban, you've seen the state of the Umgeni estuary in particular, uh, when there's been a major rainfall event and the amount of plastic that comes through those systems. We can also look at the different types of microplastics uh, from fibers uh, to fragments to microbeads. Um, these are your primary and secondary microplastics and they differ um, quite significantly uh, between our estuaries that have low levels of development compared to our estuaries that have high level of development. So the microplastics concentrations um, in the water and mangrove sediment were highest in systems impacted by industry, um, as well as residential and uh, agricultural land uses in compare, comparison to somewhere like St. Lucia, uh, which has a, a, a much lower number of activities. Um, Trishen Naidu during his postdoc um, looked at how the microplastics may find their way from the environment, which is the water and the sediment, um, into the biota that use the mangroves. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, the ecosystem services of the mangroves is to provide a refugia and nursery function. Um, and therefore, if the health of those mangroves are lowered, the potential to provide that function is reduced as well. So we have, um, Trishen specifically has found a number of microplastics in different types of fish um, and in different estuaries uh, within KwaZulu-Natal. Uh, more recently, PhD candidate Jamie Johnson um, has began, begun to examine fiddler crabs and fiddler crabs in the mangrove forest are what we call ecosystem engineers. Um, therefore, they have a huge role to play in maintaining the health of the ecosystem. Um, and she's began to look at these fiddler crabs as well as salt marsh crabs and mangrove snails to see if they are ingesting microplastics as well. So in terms of um, the presentation, I've shown you quite a bit of the impacts and threats to mangrove forests along the eastern coastline of South Africa. Um, and these threats range from mouth closure due to freshwater abstraction, um, grazing and browsing. Um, we even have driving on habitats, um, harvesting and erosion. And all of these threats will have the capacity to reduce 
um, regeneration as well as survival. So depending on the different activities, um, the ability and potential for regeneration is going to be um, quite variable. And to look at this, we have combined studies with the movement of man-made particles with that of measuring the population structure as well as other health indicators for the mangrove forest. Um, and that is work that has been carried out by two master's students. So are the mangrove forests um, um, increasing in terms of their size? Are they uh, producing propagules and seedlings? And are those seedlings surviving from a seedling to a sapling? Um, uh, life class. Um, those would all give us indications of whether we are dealing with a healthy mangrove system um, or not. So Janine Adams um, and I produced a paper in 2020 where we looked at the status of mangroves in South Africa using the DIPSTAR framework. So this is the driver pressure state impacts and response framework. And I thought it would be a good idea to end off the presentation looking at this particular diagram. So we've talked about the threats um, uh, that face our mangrove forests. The impacts are lower species diversity, loss of production, loss of ecosystem services, such as carbon storage, um, changes in the population structure. And how we can respond to these um, impacts are to look at um, how the estuarine is functioning and how much fresh water is coming through. Um, using buffer zones in order to ensure that mangroves and salt marsh are able to move backward as sea level rise becomes a, a major issue. We need to implement our estuarine management plans. So we cannot manage our mangrove forests without managing our estuaries as well, because the mangroves are dependent on the estuarine condition in order to maintain itself. Um, we need better monitoring and enforcement, as well as um, uh, policing of legislation um, in our protected areas. Environmental education is um, a two-way street. Not only do we need to educate people um, around uh, estuaries and mangrove forests, but we ourselves need to be educated by their knowledge. Um, so community engagement in policy making is um, is very important in order to protect our natural resources. So these are some of the ways that we can respond to the changes that we see in order to ensure the ecosystem services um, and the resources that we rely on um, are sustainable into the long term. So I'd like to thank um, the following people in. Uh, who make this research possible, as well as the organizer of the webinar series um, for the inclusion. And I thank you for listening. Thank you, uh, Anushka. Uh, I, I must admit, uh, you, you really did uh, the, the topic justice uh, in terms of allowing us to appreciate the research that is going on in the, in the region. Um, uh, if I may have the first question, uh, because throughout your talk, this is something that has been troubling me, uh, largely because comments that I've received uh, in terms of my personal capacity as a researcher that works on coastal systems. Um, so, uh, the, the, with the publishing of the four returns framework uh, on landscape restoration, uh, which basically looks at how to balance competing stakeholder demands uh, in terms of contested spaces such as mangroves, because we must admit that mangroves are very contested spaces. Uh, there's been a lot of criticism that has been thrown to scientists like you and myself uh, around the fact that we are so busy documenting mass mortality events that we're not involved in preventing them. Uh, and we have been criticized uh, as African scientists uh, for not uh, using the opportunity that we have in working in spaces like mangroves to engage in mass replanting events, to engage in landscape restoration to the extent that we should be uh, as researchers that work in spaces that lend themselves to applied research. 
I'd like to hear your comment on this. Yeah, that's a, that's quite a, um, a big statement. Um, yes, I think in a lot of cases we are reactive and not proactive. Um, and, you know, it, a lot of it comes from the fact that we have a coastline with almost 300 estuaries um, that are unequally distributed in areas that are both urbanized and rural. And to keep an eye on all 300 would be quite a mammoth task. Um, and therefore, we do find ourselves being more reactive rather than uh, proactive. When it comes to restoration and the regrowth of mangroves, um, we're currently writing a, a book within the Western Indian Ocean on restoration practices. Um, and when we engage with um, our colleagues from the Western Indian Ocean countries, uh, we gain a lot of knowledge in terms of how to go about these replanting uh, exercises. And we're gaining um, a lot of knowledge on, on what could work within our mangrove systems. And that's exactly what is the um, topic for our mangrove chapter. Um, because our mangroves are very different to what you would find in further north, and because they're all sitting in estuaries, um, the management and the restoration of our estuaries is paramount to the management and restoration um, of our mangrove forests. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's it's. It's a difficult question to ask to answer, um, but I would say that um, I think that the research that we're doing, um, as baseline as it is, uh, we are able to apply what we find in one forest um, to the other forests that are um, in better states, and that helps us to identify forests that may need to be uh, provided with protection status in order to um, ensure that those forests um, are more sustainable. Thank you, Anusha. I'd like to recognize uh, Jerome, uh, who has his hand up. Oh, thanks, Ashin. Uh, Anusha, great talk. Thank you very much for, for doing this for us. Quick question for you. I was just wondering what your thoughts were in terms of who should be taking responsibility for you know, some of the mangroves and some of our estuaries. You know, I think some of the challenges we have is there are different levels of government. And so you find national level of government putting in place the big overarching policies, but it's basically local government sometimes and provincial governments that have the mandate to, for example, move communities into house communities who live along rivers and who contribute to pollution. So, you know, I'm just wondering, like, you know, we, the end result is, well, the end, end victim are probably, you know, the mangroves. But I'm not sure how we actually or who takes responsibility for, for that. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if you look at the sources of pollution, it, you have to look at who's responsible for managing those potential sources. So we've got issues where we've got informal settlements, but no ministry or no local government wants to take responsibility. For that. And provincial governments and national governments also, you know, it's, it's a shared mandate in a sense. But, you know, somebody has to, has, somebody has to take the responsibility to prevent destruction. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts were in terms of which level of government should be taking the responsibility for mangroves, for managing mangroves, and also for preventing uh, damage to the mangroves. Over. Thank you very much for that question. Um, I think, you know, in terms of um, the legislation, there is good legislation in terms of how to manage the environment and and uh, from my point of view this question is almost a question that you'd have to ask in KwaZulu-Natal and then you'd have to re-ask it in the Eastern Cape um, and that's because um, of the um, major difference in the capacity of your local and municipality um, um, authorities within those particular areas. Um, so within KwaZulu-Natal I would say um, that your um, municipal government should be um, implementing the um, environmental management policies um, in, because they have um, a greater knowledge of what's happening with, uh, within the local, um, the local situation. Within the Eastern Cape, I would say that the government authorities need to empower 
the communities that are, are sitting around these estuaries are living around these estuaries um, and in that way support and capacitate them in order to continue uh, managing the way that they use their sustainable resources. Um, in, in, in our past history, there has been um, evidence to show that local communities um, and the authorities within those communities do have a major influence on the um, resources. Um, and therefore, I think it's, it, it depends on, on wh where you are and, wh and what you're looking at in terms of um, trying to decide who is the best uh, to, to take over the management of those particular forests. Thank you. Thank you, Anusha. Uh, if, there are, if there are no other questions, uh, I'd, uh, I think we are trying to be religious in terms of uh, respecting time given the length of these sessions. I want to thank Larson and Anusha for kicking off what I believe is going to be a very, very interesting se uh, series of talks. Uh, I, I want to thank the organizers for giving us this platform and colleagues, we look forward to having you back with us on the 5th of August for the next uh, session of talks. Uh, and as you can see, we are trying to expose you to case studies and experiences from across the world and across the continent. Uh, thank you for joining us and we will see you on the 5th of August for the next series of talks. Same time, same place, stay well and get vaccinated. Take care, bye.